Okay, well, good morning everyone and welcome to um, 1251 EDN, um, quite a big long name, ICTs for Teaching and Learning. And this is our week two where we're going to be discussing in particular various ICTs. And I have with me, well my name's Dr. Jason Zagami, and I have with me on the panel Bryce. Bryce, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, <laughs> And we have Jade. Hello, how are you going? We have Lara. Hi, I'm Lara. <laughs> and Sophie. Hey. Okay, it's not working. Yes, Sophie, I can hear you. You're a little bit quiet. Um, if maybe you could adjust that at some point on your computer. And if there are others that signed up to be on the panel and would like to check your Google Plus account. Okay, you need to be signed into your Google Plus Gmail account to receive the invites, um, and then you'll receive an invite and be able to join us on the panel. And if there's anyone from last week that would also like to be on the panel, we've got a few slots available, um, so you're welcome to request an invite. In fact, I'll send one out to you now, and you can then join us as well. Let's see. One, two, five, one. So this week we're discussing um, a whole series of basic ICTs that we would expect most teachers to be reasonably familiar with. So hopefully you've done the readings and you've got some questions for me. So, well first off though, do we have any questions about the course in general? Following on from last week's examination of the course documents, and if you're watching online, I can see there's five of you watching online at the moment, um, and like to submit questions into the Q&A box. Or if you're on the Today's Meet, you can ask questions using that link as well. Okay, well, it's good to see that there's still no burning questions about the course itself. Um, let's get into discussing then our um, readings for this week and starting off with presentation tools. So who's, has anyone ever not used PowerPoint? Or one of the other presentation tools? So can anyone give me a good experience of using PowerPoint? Uh, by experience, do you mean like some of the tools that you can actually use with PowerPoint? Yep, that could be an example or an experience that you've had when you've used it, say, in doing a presentation for an assignment or if you've ever done so on any other areas outside of school. Okay, well, um, in my Cert 2 IT course, what we did was um, we pretty much played a game and we had to pretty much explain to people how it works. And at the start, we had music playing throughout the whole entire thing. You can have a title page with, like, a picture and then going through it, you can just have text, text boxes, and then the next vi um, clip can be like a video. Yep. And you can have separate videos throughout it that you just have to click on because it's just hyperlinked. So you went through and incorporated all the different things you could do in a PowerPoint presentation and included those. Now that, that's a good way of learning about the technologies. And Kara is joining us. <laughs> Finally, well, sorry. That's okay. So we're just talking at the moment about any anecdotes anyone has about using PowerPoint or Keynote or the other presentation tools, or maybe one that you've seen that was very impressive um, and engaging for your learning. Um, I've just sort of found that um, if you just use pictures, it's easier to sort of direct your presentation at the classroom as opposed to reading off the slides. Yes, now that's a very common approach nowadays, um, whereby presentations are given where they only use images, or images with very, very few words, um, or sorry, slides with very few words. Now, getting a little bit of feedback, so Jade, if you're not speaking, could you mute your microphone when you're not speaking? There's just a little bit of noise coming through. Possibly through feedback from the speakers. Um, when someone else is speaking, it might come through yours and then feedback through your microphone and provide that. 
Um, that's where headphones are often very useful to wear, so it cuts down on the um, additional noise. Okay, so we've got a question from Tiana. I've pretty much only ever used it in school when doing speeches in English or ancient history, etc. Yes, that's where most people probably start off with using um, PowerPoint. But has anyone ever seen a PowerPoint presentation that really impressed them? And welcome, Kendra. Okay, has anyone ever seen um, a TED talk or um, any of the online recordings of presentations? Okay, um, I'll have to give you some links to those or introduce you to some of those at some stage during the course. But there are lots and lots of um, recorded presentations done at conferences mostly, um, but also sometimes at universities and things of that, that nature, whereby really sort of polished and um, detailed and effective presentations have been done. And it's a good way of learning about how to do really good presentations yourself when you get into the classroom by looking at how experts have done so um, who are basically paid and sometimes paid sometimes even in the millions of dollars to actually do these presentations at conferences and so forth. So seeing how they do it and all the production processes and skills that they put into doing their presentations can be a good way of improving your own presentation skills. But being able to use PowerPoint and the associated other tools is an effective um, skill that you need to develop as a teacher because um, you'll probably be doing a lot of these during your um, the career and it's something that you want to make sure you can do efficiently and effectively. But as was mentioned, just using images can be a great way of doing it. A lot of um, students often rely upon the text on PowerPoint presentations as a crutch, um, a bit like how you might have used palm cards in the past. And in fact, um, it's probably best to keep using palm cards um, rather than putting all of your text onto the PowerPoint presentations and then trying to present with that. Um, uh, the audience, or the, the learners, don't tend to like having to read huge large chunks of text um, straight off the PowerPoint presentations. So one rule of thumb is have no more than six words per slide. And again, it's more just to try to stop you from putting up too much um, and using the PowerPoint presentation as simply a, a narrative for, your, for what you're saying. Um, other things that research has found is that generally people will only ever remember three things from, from a, a lesson given in that way um, or a presentation given in that way. So if you're expecting to teach a whole lot of concepts, probably not the best format. Um, think about maybe th up to three concepts that you want students to take away from at the end of a presentation. The other thing is that generally students will remember the last couple of slides in a presentation um, and maybe the first couple of slides but the ones in the middle tend not to be remembered. So there's actually more research, there's actually cycles whereby there's different stages when people remember things more effectively than others and there are cycles when they just become so bored they won't remember anything. Um, so there's a lot of research into how to do really effective PowerPoint presentations but in the main we try to move away from them because they're not seen as the most effective learning tool. A um, few things from Stephen. There's a few lecturers that use too many words on their slides, yes, and that can become a problem, particularly if you're just taking your notes and your, what you're going to say and you're popping those up on the slides. Now, I've got a little bit of feedback coming through someone's speakers where you're not wearing headphones and you don't have your mic muted, um, possibly from Indy, so if you want to just try muting yourself when you're not speaking, that might help, or wear some headphones and we'll get rid of that. Now, Bailey finds PowerPoint usually boring, and yes, you're correct, sometimes they can be very boring, but sometimes they can be made exciting, particularly if you're using really engaging imagery, and sometimes the appropriate use of some video clips, they can really break up someone's speaking and give the audience a chance to um, retune their minds between concepts, um, but sometimes they can also be distracting, so it's really a balancing act of doing good lessons with PowerPoint. Um, and getting it to work effectively will depend upon your particular style for teaching and it's something you normally will develop over many years and slowly improve upon. Um, Maria's seen one by a 12 year old that was really impressive 
So, Maria, what made that particularly impressive? If you could give us an answer to that at some stage. And for the others, has anyone ever seen some online PowerPoint presentations? Um, so one's done with Google Slides or one of the other tools. <laughs> Probably saying no to that. <laughs> OK, so Lee has had a, her sister, who's in year 12, and she used Prezi for her history presentation. Yes, Prezi is a, another great uh, presentation tool that we'll talk about in a second. And if you haven't seen a Prezi, I encourage you to follow some of the links that are, are provided in the readings and have a look at what Prezi can do. Of course, it's like a, it's like a PowerPoint presentation, but it's much more interactive and engaging because um, things are constantly moving and um, you can incorporate a number of different special effects. Um, a little bit like what teachers used to do. They used to have a different transition for every slide and a whole lot of other things there. Um, so it is PowerPoint presentations are useful in their place. It's just when people overuse them or abuse them, um, and use them as a replacement for what they're saying and things of that nature, as an adjunct to what they're saying, then they become tedious and disengaging. Okay, so there's other technologies though that people use with PowerPoint presentations such as clickers. Well, these are clickers that you can automatically um, change the slides. You'll find a lot of lecturers and teachers now will have one of these devices and they can go from slide to slide without actually having to be at the keyboard, so it allows you to move around more. And you can even do it now, say, one thing I often use is use my iPad and it will show what's on the slides and I can use that to transition between slides. So I can walk around with my iPad and see what's on the slides coming up and flick between slides that are then shown on my laptop which is connected to the projector. Um, more and more now though, people are using tablet devices directly connected to projectors or wirelessly connected to projectors and so you can pre present just off your device. Um, so there's various other tools that are being used. Laser pointers were a big thing in the 70s where people could use laser pointers to show you the word that they were referring to. Uh, but over time, we're probably tending to move away from PowerPoint type presentations, but they are still very popular. Anyone want to make any comments about those sort of presentations? Okay. Well, slide casting is another area that's been very popular for a while. This is where you actually record your voice with your slides and then you have a recording of that. And you'll find most of your courses done in the lecture theatres at university will be recorded and made available so that you can listen to the person speaking and see the slides change as you go. That's one approach. Uh, the TED Talks, which is um, something I suggest you do a little search for, um, has another approach whereby they video the presenter and they record that and they have less emphasis on the slides and in fact they discourage people using slides and they rely upon the presenters presentation skills and their body language to carry the audience through what they're talking about. Now those tend to be very much rehearsed and they actually have experts and um, drama and media people work with them for often up to a month beforehand getting down their presentation so that they're very very polished. But that's not to say you can't do the same thing and in fact you'll probably do a lot of that in your teaching where you don't rely necessarily just upon slides but you talk to your students and you take them through discussions about various things. The other big advantage in a classroom is you can make that then more interactive. Um, the dangers of PowerPoint and presentation tools is that they tend not to be very interactive. A little bit like this video at the moment whereby the students involved in the presentation or the discussion are contributing an awful lot. Uh, but we we'll hope to change that in a few seconds whereby you guys start talking a lot more. Okay, so Google Slides is another thing I've talked about in the video um, whereby we can now do a lot of our presentations using online tools which means we don't actually have to download files or present them off the projector. They can actually, students can look at them on their own devices or at home when they're on the internet. And Stephen puts forward a comment that the TED presenters are amazing and they draw you in. Yes, they are very, very engaging. There is a little bit of criticism of them because they do tend to approach very, very complex subjects and simplify them. But for the audience and for the intent of what the TED Talks are, they're very effective. And a lot of students are using um, TED Talks as a way of getting ideas. And there's a lot of really good TED Talks around education. So I really do encourage you to have a look at the TED Talks. Um, 
and see what they're involved in. And they're in categories, and you can actually look at them specifically for education. They now hold TED Talks around the world. And in fact, we have TED Talks here in the Gold Coast. Um, St. Hilda's, one of our local schools, um, runs TED Talks or TEDx Talks and have those whereby they bring in a lot of speakers and provide those short little presentations and sometimes they even get the students to do the presentations. So there's a whole range of different approaches to using that type of presentation tool. Okay, so again you're probably going to experience lots of different uses of presentation tools during your course of study where various subjects will get you to do um, presentations and in this course there's a couple of the options you've got to use presentation tools such as doing a slide cast or doing a Prezi presentation so if you want to learn more about those choose one of those activities and get involved in that. Do we have any questions or comments or statements about presentation tools? I think I remember. Cara oh, sorry, yep, Cara? I think presentations are really um, useful and everything, and especially if you've got lots of colour and things like that, too. and especially engaging like young kids. I think the more colour you have and the less words, the easier it is. They can be, and particularly the use of images. Um, we are a storytelling people in that most of our learning throughout history has always been done through storytelling, and storytelling with images can be more effective. That's why they used to have cave paintings, um, so they could sit around and tell the story and refer to the cave paintings and get across the ideas and concepts about what they were teaching about hunting or gathering food or avoiding animals um, more effectively. And we've always used storytelling with images all the way through the Renaissance, uh, particularly in our churches, where we have lots of stained glass windows and images, and they were used for storytelling. You would go around each of the different stained glass windows and a story would be told about what was depicted in those images. And nowadays, of course, we have storybooks and picture books that we use in our younger years to engage students with the concepts being learnt. Um, PowerPoint really does have an extension of that. Of course, we don't tend to sit around a storybook in our senior years now, um, although sometimes textbooks encourage us to do so. Uh, we often gather around the PowerPoint presentation and we tell a story about what's to be learnt through that mechanism. Now, Maria is doing a digital narrative for another course. Any tips or pointers? Never did one before. Okay, a digital narrative could refer to a range of different concepts, but generally it's the use of digital tools or te technologies to provide a narrative. And now that might incorporate the use of PowerPoint or presentation tools, but it might also incorporate the use of video or audio or even a game um, or the various other technologies that can be used um, to tell a story. Um, so there's a range of different ways of telling stories nowadays with the use of technology and a digital narrative generally refers to those various approaches. Um, so hopefully some of the technologies you see today you might be able to incorporate in your digital narrative for your other subject. So any other questions or statements about presentation tools? Uh, yeah, um, instead of using PowerPoint from what I've seen now a lot of people are starting to use screen capturing tools so that they can inter like do an audio um, interactive uh, sort of I don't know example. Yes, now I know what you mean, and the videos that I present to you guys each week are done through screen capture. Now, there's certain advantages to screen capture in that a PowerPoint. Uh, well, before I say that, um, there had to be a move uh, before screen capture became popular to actually just using what was on your computer to do your presentation. So instead of having um, a slideshow pre-prepared where you had all your images put into a PowerPoint presentation and all your bits of text put into a PowerPoint presentation, you would simply open up documents and, and photos that were on your computer and you would go through and present those. Um, so if you wanted to show an image of something, you would simply open up that image file that's on your computer and show that onto your screen. If you wanted to refer to a bit of text from a textbook, you'd open up that textbook on, on the screen and you'd show that. So instead of actually having everything pre-prepared into a PowerPoint presentation, you would simply draw upon whatever images or other items or video clips that you had on your computer and you would ad hoc make your presentation as you went. 
Now that had some advantages in that you could change your presentation as you went. One of the disadvantages of PowerPoint is that if you decide to change things depending upon the audience or um, what the questions are that are occurring during your presentation, you are really trapped into continuing on with the actual presentation that you'd pre-designed. Now that might be okay with a university lecture and so forth, but in a classroom environment, in a K-12 environment, very often students will ask questions and take you off on a tangent that if your PowerPoint is really um, pre-prepared to keep you going in one particular direction, you can't really adapt to and change. But if you're simply drawing upon images and video clips and files that are on your computer, if the students decide to go off on a tangent um, asking questions about relativity that you weren't really prepared to actually discuss um, when you designed your PowerPoint, you might be able to have those files on your computer and draw them and incorporate those into your presentation as you went. Now screencasting is a little bit like that, although we've probably moved more back towards the more formal pre-prepared screencast, um, whereby you're simply showing what's happening on your computer screen and then recording that. Now there's some advantage to that though in that if you say want to present some text, often it's easier to present that and have the students then refer to that when they look at it on your screen with what might be in their textbook. Um, likewise, you might want to show video clips or say a computer game or a simulation or any other software that might be available on your computer um, that you don't necessarily have available to insert inside a PowerPoint presentation. Now Kendra, if you need to pop away and things like that, you can mute your um, your screen and your audio. That might be a bit more convenient for you than having to uh, move away from the actual desk. Um, now Tiana's dad uses PowerPoint nice. all the time on a projector in his classroom. Yes, very commonly used. And to find where the mute is, if you just hover your mouse over the screen, you'll see a little bar along the top and you'll see a little microphone and a little video camera that you can turn on and off as you need to. Of course, where possible, we'd like to see you having your video on because it's more engaging to us. So, um, we'll probably move on then from presentation tools. Okay, you will use them a lot during your teacher training and as a teacher, you'll come very used to using digital projectors and interactive whiteboards, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, though before, before now, we used to rely much more upon blackboards. Um, when I did my teacher training, we had lessons on how to use blackboard and how to sharpen chalk and uh, what clothes not to wear, so not wearing black and all the rest, of course, of the chalk dust that would accumulate on your clothing. Um, but you don't have to worry too much about that these days. You'll generally have whiteboards, although there are still some blackboards available in classrooms. Um, particularly in language rooms, uh, particularly the Japanese language where they like to use the chalk as a replacement for doing their particular um, particular language writing. But nowadays generally you'll have um, whiteboards whereby you use whiteboard pens and you get a range of colors that you can do diagrams and write text up on. But more and more now we simply go straight to digital projection. Uh, of course, we've had the investment into schools whereby there's pretty much digital projectors in most classrooms, certainly in most high school classrooms, and whatever's on your computer screen, you can then project. Uh, before that, though, we used to have to produce slides where you'd photocopy slides onto pieces of transparent film and use a projector, um, a, a slide projector, or not, not a slide projector, what do we call them, an overhead projector, um, to present what was on those slide, those pieces of transparent plastic and teachers would spend a long time writing out and preparing those pieces of plastic. Sometimes teachers would prepare them in big long rolls, sometimes individual A4 sheets, and there were some teachers that would use the same roll of plastic year after year, and it would slowly degrade over time and go yellow. Um, but yeah, so Tiana's still at a school where there are a few blackboards, and there are some advantages of blackboards, although probably the disadvantages well and truly outweigh them nowadays. Um, they used to be a little bit fun. You could make some really interesting sound effects on a blackboard, um, which we've lost the ability to do on our whiteboards. Um, and if students were not paying attention, you could gain their attention very quickly by um, scraping the chalk across the blackboard. Um, and of course, you no longer have blackboard erasers to throw at students. Um, but of course, you wouldn't do that nowadays anyhow. 
Um, but in the main, no, blackboards had a lot of disadvantages, particularly the blackboard chalk dust, which you would get covered in as a teacher. And um, yeah, you can be thankful that we've moved on generally from the use of blackboards. OK, well, let's go on now to the latest technology that's in, being incorporated into schools, one of the latest, um, interactive whiteboards. Has anyone had any experience with an interactive whiteboard or a smart board or digital whiteboard or whatever else they may be called? Yeah, I'm seeing... I have at... Oh, sorry. You I have at school. Sorry. I've okay, had so at school. Okay, so what's... Yep. But um, also I went into a primary classroom one time and they were able to read a book off the, inter um, off the whiteboard, like have mm -hmm. a big up and all the kids could see it, so it was great. Like, all the kids were actually watching because <laughs> they could see. Yep. So it's a great way of gaining students' attention. But what were your experiences? What did you use it for when you were at school? Um, we didn't use it much. Well, like, by the time it came in, I was older, so we didn't okay. use it much. Yep. So you missed out on that opportunity. Now, who else had an example? I was, um, I did prep last year and I was in a grade 2 classroom and the grade 2s were actually showing me how to use it because I've never seen it before and they were actually telling me but then I was talking to one of the other girls who had said that she was in a prep classroom and the preps had actually turned it off and because they were so reliant on it they spent nearly another hour trying to figure out how to turn it back on again. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes the preps or sometimes students can know more about the technologies that are being used in the classroom and disrupt things. Uh, however, hopefully through this course and through your teacher preparation program, you'll become familiar enough with these technologies that the students won't be able to play those tricks on you. Yeah. Kendra, did you have something you were trying to say before? Yeah, well, I used that about um, chemistry. Oh yes, and what did you, how did you use yeah. it? Oh, what's happening? Okay. Um, I, so we were what senior chemistry, so year eleven and twelve. And um, how we'd do it is would the teacher would put up a game at the periodic table, and we'd find as many periodic table things as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's happening? No, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, yes, often we use oh, interactive yeah. whiteboards as they were designed to be used and in an interactive way. Sometimes they're just used in a less interactive presentation tool. Of course, they've got a digital projector and they've got a flat surface where you can project onto. But the idea of the interactive whiteboards is to have some sort of interaction between yourself and the screen. Um, and it might be a game whereby students come up and tap different sections of the screen based upon the image that's being projected there. That's probably the most common aspect. But also nowadays we can also project what's happening on our own computer screens onto the digital projector and then students can use that. A lot of teachers simply use it to transition between slides, so tapping on the screen, moving from one slide to another, uh, but that's the very least interactive um, use of digital whiteboards. Um, but also you can record what's been put onto them, so you might say in Japanese, do your kanji writing onto it, as an example, someone's giving, Lee's giving, and then have that recorded and for really good software that's running on it, it might be able to interpret how it was written on the whiteboard and provide advice on how it can be improved or compared against the model of what the writing should look like. So for example, students learning their cursive handwriting might come up to the inter interactive write whiteboard and write their name and then that can be compared with what should have been written in terms of um, their handwriting and the differences can be shown on the interactive whiteboard. Um, Stephen mentions that power outages can have a great impact upon technology. Yes, there can be problems um, with the technology, uh, particularly if they're reliant upon power and power supply, although that is improving in schools and as we rely upon more and more on technology, then the infrastructure that supports that technology is improving, be that through power supplies or through um, the internet connection, the wireless connection and so forth. So. That said, though, teachers were often had the same issue when we had um, overhead projectors where you had your entire lesson all prepared on slides for an overhead projector and then you come to school and you find that the bulb was blown or the power has gone out and other things might have occurred and so it's always important to have a backup when you're teaching and relying upon technology. But more and more that's becoming less and less of a problem. So any other examples of the use of interactive whiteboards? 
Keanu would like a few more examples. Okay, we'll put probably some of the ones I've seen. Um, game playing is a really good one, whereby the students can come up and fill in the blanks or um, reveal different squares. Um, matching games are a good one, where you have different matching occurring. But also just for simulations, say if it's a physics simulation, and instead of them using a computer to manipulate the variables of the physics simulation, they can come up to the interactive whiteboard and with sliders or different buttons on the screen, press those and change the simulation that's being presented. Um, Kendra, I might just get you to mute your microphone again because I think we're getting a little bit of feedback through there when you're not speaking. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. It's like all... <laughs> yes, I've been... Okay. Um, to mute your microphone, just if you hover your mouse across the screen, you'll see in the top middle of your screen a few little icons, one of which will be a little microphone symbol. And if you click on that, it'll go red. And that will show that your microphone has been muted. Or I can do it manually from here. <laughs> there you go. So when you... Wonderful. Okay, so what? So is it a kind of a big tablet? Actually, that's a very good analogy. Um, and tablets are basically replacing interactive whiteboards. So, it, so an interactive whiteboard or an interactive display, of course, there are now a number of... Um, big LCD TVs that are also interactive where you can touch screen the TV and they're being used to replace interactive whiteboards in some schools. Um, but you can consider it like a big tablet computer whereby you can come up and actually touch the screen and have things happen and change. Um, but as the price of tablet computers have decreased greatly, um, generally we're finding it's more cost effective to provide each individual student with a tablet device than to invest in the large interactive display that every student has to watch and then only a few students get to actually interact with at any one time. Um, and yes, sometimes teachers are too short to use the interactive whiteboards if they've been installed incorrectly um, and sometimes students are too short. Um, so ideally in interactive whiteboards are installed at an appropriate height and some of them are now installed whereby they're actually adjustable and you can adjust the height. Certainly the portable ones, you can certainly adjust the height very easily with um, but that is a problem, although it was a problem just with um, whiteboards and even blackboards. Um, you may have been into some classrooms where the blackboards were on rollers, where you could actually have um, a couple of blackboards and roll them behind one another. Um, that assisted teachers that were um, height challenged, and they could then roll it down to their height and then increase the height of the blackboard as they needed to, to display it to the students. Um, I have a question. Yep. Do you know how obviously there's been blackboards and then whiteboards and now interactive whiteboards? Where do you think that the t like the future of technology is going to be with whiteboards and such? <laughs> do you kind of have uh, an idea, or is it more? I like do. It, it's no it's an area I do a lot of research around. Um, I think we're going to go through a transition phase initially, whereby every surface in a classroom, including the windows and the roof and even the floor will actually be interactive um, and because the technology is now getting to the point whereby it's very, very cheap to apply an interactive film and you'll even find this in magazines now whereby there might be an interactive screen in a magazine and it's so cheap to actually produce they're coming out in magazines. So given the cost of interactive screens dropping dramatically, I think within a couple of years all of our surfaces will be interactive and I've provided a couple of videos on the in the readings. Um, uh, a day of glass and some of the Microsoft ones where they've explored that concept of just how interactive the world's going to be in the next couple of years. And that's certainly one area we're going to go through and we'll just have a bit, almost everything that you touch will be interactive. Um, but there's another technology emerging over the next year which will be whereby we wear these glasses and the interactivity is projected through our glasses. So what, wherever we're looking at can be interactive. So if you're looking at another student, you might be able to see all their Facebook details being projected around them. Um, or you might be looking at, a, at a, um, a blank wall and using that as your TV screen or your computer screen. Um, they've even got contact lenses now that do the same. So that's a technology that may um, supersede even the interactivity nature of our surfaces. Um, 
So there's a number of competing technologies that are emerging in that respect. And then there's even a few technologies further down the track that actually stimulate various, sense, various parts of our brain in terms of our senses um, and can interact directly with the brain. But that's probably 10 to 20 years away. But it could certainly happen during your careers. Um, so there's a whole range of new technologies. We're just starting off today talking about the very basic technologies um, that currently exist and are just emerging into schools. But as of any form of technology in today's society, it's rapidly advancing and you'll have to face new challenges as new technologies emerge and impact upon the classroom throughout your careers. Um, so a couple other little questions on board here. Could, a, could be a board that interacts with something like the Wii console. Yes, Stephen, that's another aspect of um, interactivity whereby we can use gestures um, and hand movements and body movements to interact with our screens. Um, I've got a little device that connects to my computer where I can just wave my hands around and um, affect the computer screen. That's called a leap motion device. And that's the thing that will probably be built into laptops and a lot of other computers over the next few years, whereby instead of actually moving a mouse around, you'll simply wave your fingers around in front of the screen and things will change and move and interact. Um, but they have those devices that can work off interactive whiteboards. Um, the Wii devices where you've got little handheld remotes that can move things around based upon your movements of your hand. But then there's the connect based devices developed by Microsoft which actually detect your body movements. And so you can have students standing in front of an interactive whiteboard and if they want to change slides they simply wave their hand in front of the um, slide and it will change. Or they can, the actual slide projector or the digital interactive whiteboard can detect their body movements and based upon the movement of their heads or their arms or their feet um, can have various interactions occurring. Um, so there's a lot of changes occurring with the way we interact with computers and with digital technologies um, that are emerging into classrooms at the moment, uh, particularly being used in health and PE where you want to get students being more active and, in, and engaged during a lesson. So instead of sitting behind their desks, um, you've got them up actually doing movements and activities. Uh, so another one from Lee, sometimes people accidentally use whiteboard markers on interactive whiteboards. Okay, yeah, that's where they use permanent markers. Um, most interactive whiteboards now will be okay with the use of um, non-permanent markers, although there are a few older interactive whiteboards that relied upon very specific markers that um, you didn't write at all upon the actual whiteboard. That's slowly changing so that you can incorporate a mix of them. But just as with whiteboards, um, there was always the odd permanent whiteboard marker that falls its way into um, a teacher's collection of markers and you become very embarrassed when you go to wipe off what's on the whiteboard and find that it doesn't disappear. Um, and yes, so Tiana was making that same point. Uh, the cost could hardly outweigh the advantages from interactive whiteboards and tablets. Um, well, certainly I would agree. There are a lot of advantages to using interactive whiteboards and interactive tablets and so forth. However, there are many teachers in our schools that have been very used to using um, other technologies such as slides or overhead projectors for many, many years and have been very successful in teaching with the use of those technologies. So the move to incorporating new technologies can sometimes be difficult for them as we discussed last week. Um, so if you've already achieved success with your existing technologies, um, engaging with a new technology can sometimes seem more effort than, it's, than the benefit. So they often need to be shown the benefits um, before they will actually make that move. But the same thing happened has happened throughout history. Uh, the move to using printed books was strongly resisted. Of course, people saw that it would take away from the ability for students to memorize, uh, where in the past they used to have to memorize huge, large texts. Um, having a book mean, meant they no longer had to memorize, and that was seen as a very bad thing. Um, likewise, even having pens was seen as a bad thing, because with slates, you could only ever write a small amount, so you didn't come over reliant upon them. But the introduction of pens, people started writing huge amounts of stuff, and they weren't paying anywhere near as much attention to their writing as they used to when they had to rely just upon writing on slates. Um, so there are always advantages and disadvantages to any new technology. But you're correct. When the advantages are seen to be overwhelming, then people tend to move. OK, oh, and in, in terms of interactive tables, Yes, interactive tables probably aren't taking off as a technology. 
Um, they are very expensive, and the advantages of them over interactive whiteboards are not particularly strong, particularly with the advantages of tablet devices. However, there are a few schools, we've got um, one just up the road here on the Gold Coast, that have installed interactive tables um, into what's been known as, an, as a learning space, whereby students can be withdrawn from classes and come to a space, a little bit like a library, but it's full of these interactive tables and other te technology devices, and students can um, carry on their independent learning um, using those tools. Particularly popular for group work, um, so the interactive tables do have some advantages. In fact, I've got a PhD student doing his um, research on the use of interactive tables in schools at the moment. Uh, and there are some advantages to be found from them. However, probably not sufficient at the moment to warrant the wholesale adoption of those over other competing technologies, such as tablet devices. OK, well, let's. Any other examples about interactive tablets then? Has anyone been into a school or were in a school themselves where you were using um, either laptops or tablet devices, such as iBooks yeah. or other ones? Yeah. Can you give any advice on what it was like? Um, well, I wasn't in a school that used them, but where I worked for my um, set three, it was a school that had like iPods, um, iPads, we had iPods, iPads, B-Bots, you name it, they had it, Nintendos, DS's. Um, it was actually really, like, because I was in the librarian side of it, it was really crazy to handle, and would always have iPads missing, iPods missing, teachers blaming other teachers, so it's not really the students that made it really hard, but it was actually really successful. Every class had at least, a, well, each block of classes had at least a set of iPods, and each class always had like um, I Nintendo's or some, something with them to help them and it, but yeah, it just was really successful with them I guess. Yes and, and you do raise an important point that um, often it's difficult for teachers to come to grips with the use of these new technologies while students are very enthusiastic about them um, and they do often introduce a whole lot of new manage management processes that we need to think about. Uh, one of the first ones was the fact that very few classrooms had enough PowerPoints to accommodate students wanting to recharge their laptops. Um, that's something that's slowly changing in our classrooms. And then Wi-Fi access across the school. Often Wi-Fi would only be available in uh, one or two classrooms or in the library. And that slowly had to roll out across the whole school. So there's been a whole range of different challenges. And if the school itself is managing the devices, then having a loan system often fell upon lib librarian staff because they were used to learning out books. So learning out other technologies wasn't seen as too different to learning out books, but it involved a whole lot of other challenges, such as um, ways of recharging banks of equipment. Um, a lot of libraries installed huge banks of recharging stations to be able to try to cope with that. Um, but that then Here's imposed a whole lot of additional time restraints on them. Sorry. Yep. We had to chase everything up. Like, and the students weren't the ones that were irresponsible with it. We would have like a box of iPads missing, or at least a iPad missing, or an iPod, and go to the teacher that would set and go, "Hey, look, there's this number iPod missing," and they'll go, "Oh no, this teacher had it," and we would just be wild goose chasing this iPod around the whole school and would never know exactly who had it, what happened with it. So it's not the students that were really irresponsible. It was really the teachers. It's actually really weird. Yes, there can be management processes and difficulties. Um, what we're finding though is that as we move more to one-to-one -to -one, and particularly bring your own technologies where all the teachers and the students have their own individual devices, then they pay a lot more attention to the management of that and feel more responsible for looking after their own devices. It's when you have got lots of devices that are being loaned out to people that don't feel any ownership over them, then there can be a lot of problems around that. So a few more questions from the audience. Uh, so Lee asks, um, there were interactive tables at our high school, and they seemed a little impractical and superfluous, maybe because of its size. OK, yep. So there have been some interactive um, tables installed in schools. And yes, they, they aren't being effectively used yet, but mostly because we haven't really explored the different ways they can be used effectively. Most new technologies coming into a school often face the challenges whereby they're not used as effectively as we'd like to see them used initially. And it does sometimes take time before strategies and appropriate uses are developed. Um, that said, tables may not be the most appropriate use in a school. Um, I suspect they may be effective in the very early years, just as interactive whiteboards were effective in the early years. 
but as we go up in, through the high schools, the advantages of individual devices or simply more traditional laptop and PC based devices uh, are probably more applicable to the way we learn and use technology in those years. Now Tiana mentions that she's on the PNC at her old high school and there's not enough infrastructure yet to support all the technology but they're catching up and it takes time for integration. And yes, you're totally correct. We are playing catch up and in fact um, things have probably changed really dramatically over the last year or two even since when most of you guys were at school. Um, the introduction of tablet devices into school is happening incredibly quickly, far faster than we, anyone expected and far faster than most systems are being able to uh, manage it appropriately. But that said, teachers and students are finding them very, very effectively used in their learning and so schools are now rapidly catching up with the infrastructure to support that, particularly in terms of internet access but also in terms of ways of charging them during the day if they're devices that need to be charged and other practical applications. Even so far down to redesign of lockers and even school bags so that they've got more padding to protect the electronic devices um, than more traditional bag systems have. Okay, a few other ones. Um, Maria's practicum school had one-to-one -one laptops, but then the students were lagging behind when their laptop was being repaired or some other teaching. Um, yeah, so it's a problem managing new devices, and the idea of, of the fact that some devices or some students may not have their device all the time. Um, a lot of schools are introducing um, a pool of devices whereby students can go to and use if they've forgotten theirs or if theirs is out for repair or um, if it needs charging even, if they've forgotten to upload or charge the battery during the day. Um, so there's a range of different uh, approaches that can be used to try to manage the um, difficulties of the use of these new technologies. Uh, okay, so other questions from the audience here. Uh, students don't really bring books anymore, they're using laptops. That is an issue um, and it's an advantage in many respects. If you've ever seen primary school kids with their bags bigger than themselves trying to carry their 20 odd books um, to and from school, you can really feel sympathy for and see the advantages of digital textbooks and iPad based devices and it's one of the probably the biggest advantages initially. Um, reducing the number of textbooks students have to be able to carry. But it also means that we can actually provide students with a lot more textbooks. So in the past, just because of the costs and the uh, capacity of most students to be able to handle um, textbooks, we'd often just maybe assign one textbook, say, for a physics, physics class. But if you've got access to, say, 20 or 30 really good um, books that explain various concepts each individually, and they're at a cost or they're free to be able to provide for students, then that makes it a possibility where in the past we wouldn't even think about providing students with multiple textbooks. And then there's also the advantage of interactive textbooks and things of that nature which we'll talk about in a second. Um, other questions, wireless charging can help with the flat battery issues? Yes, at the moment we haven't actually seen any wireless charging technologies introduced into schools. They do exist um, in what's called near field whereby if you place your device on top of a wireless charging station and maybe in the future there'll be the possibility whereby we'll have those on our desks and the students laptops will charge automatically um, when they're close enough to these wireless charging stations but at the moment the technology hasn't developed to the stage whereby we can have wireless charging occurring at, at a distance in our schools. It may occur in the future um, but we're not quite there just yet. Um, it seems that a lot of movies inspire new technology. Yes, that's a very good um, reflection. Um, a lot of movies tend to look, or the writers of movies and the directors, they tend to look at what technologies might be coming up in the future. And then we either, um, they're just ahead of the release of those technologies into the public, or sometimes they do actually presage the introduction of new technologies. Um, Probably films such as uh, Minority Reports being very um, popular in that respect in terms of interactive touch screens and how they might incorporate in the future where you've got Tom Cruise sliding these um, big screens that are transparent around and zooming in on things and that technology through aug augmented reality and so forth is now a reality and the films were 
the film was a couple of years ahead of the actual technology. And we'll look at that when we have our unit on augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, technology changes the way we can then learn that we're humans and we're adaptable. Absolutely. Um, that's the whole point of technology in that there, it opens up new possibilities and new ways of doing things. And if we didn't really want to adapt to a new way of doing things, we wouldn't really be exploring new technologies to enable us to do so. Okay, so let's get back now to our panel and let's look at our next section on interactives. Now interactives are the small little programs that we use on interactive whiteboards or on um, tablet devices and things of that nature. Has anyone got any examples where they've used or seen used an interactive, um, could be called a learning object or could, could be just an, an app on a device or a small computer program or a small little simulation that you might use on an interactive whiteboard or on a computer? Um, Indy, you might want to just unmute yourself if you're responding there. Looks like my mic was just lagging out a bit. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, it seemed that when I was in high school, a lot more there was way less interactivity because we only the only technology we had was laptops for ourselves, and the only interactivity we had was this student teacher chat where. They wouldn't exactly, you couldn't use it to respond or ask questions to the teacher. You could only pretty much use it if you were, say, not researching something you were supposed to be or something like that. They would contact you telling you to get off that. And there was no real interactivity relating to actual work that you were doing. Yes. yes. Um, we are going through a transition. <laughs> stage whereby um, somebody's microphone is feeding back arm. But yeah, we, we are going through a stage where teachers are learning how to be more interactive with the technology. And you'll see some of these, particularly when we get to the learning analytics module, about how we can actually incorporate what students are doing and learn from that and then change the way we teach in a dynamic way to adjust to improve this, their learning. Um, at the moment, teachers are still just exploring the technologies and getting to the point whereby we're really using them for true interactivity and improvement of the learning process is probably still a couple of years away. But it's we're moving rapidly towards it. Um, but just getting the technologies into the classroom, for example, getting laptops for each of you to use was probably the first step. And now the teachers are learning how to actually make better use of those for, their, for your students' learning. So Ned's got an example of Mathletics. So who's used Mathletics? Anyone else other than Ned? Okay, Mathletics yeah. is an online um, maths game whereby you solve lots of math problems and the quicker you solve them, the more points you get and you compete against other students all around the world. Um, and you slowly go up in league tables and um, improve your mathematics ability through this drill and practice approach. But it's very, very popular. In fact, incredibly popular. And if you consider how resistance many students are to doing maths homework, um, having a game like that that's very popular for students to engage with and do very similar learning is a, a great approach. And we'll talk more about that next week when we look at games in classroom. Um, Tiana says it's hard when a lot of those sorts of programs are blocked or not allowed on the school network. I remember even trying to research in science would be hard because so many sites would be blocked. Yes, it is difficult. Um, and more and more teachers are again becoming familiar with what's available and what's dangerous on the internet and those concerns about blocking everything are becoming less of a problem. Um, it still exists as a problem and there will be some resources that you won't have access to but more and more it's being recognized that there are lots of advantageous um, resources available and so those sites are being made available while we're becoming less fearful of other things on the internet and we're becoming less prevalent in blocking things. Um, there is a saying that we used to be fearful that um, people on the internet would find out where we live, what we do in real life and where we live in real life. Nowadays we, we're more fearful about what people do in real life um, find out, finding out about what we do on the internet. Um, 
So there's, there is becoming a shift in our understanding of the dangers of the internet. Anything new is considered fearful and dangerous. Um, and whenever you work with technologies, there will always be some that point out the potential dangers and difficulties. But over time, we come to realize and put those things into perspective, and they become less of a concern. There was a long time when email was blocked for students in schools. Of course, it was considered a very dangerous technology where anyone could be emailing them or they could be emailing anyone else. But over time, we've realized that, okay, that wasn't probably quite as dangerous as we initially thought, and it's become more and more available for students to use. And likewise, with other resources and tools online, um, we're coming to that realization as well. Um, so Tiana mentions that Mathletics is not blocked, but there are many that are, yes. And it's hard when... Um, I think we just answered that one. Okay. So there are lots of people working to provide collections of resources for teachers to use, so you don't have to go out and research your own. You'll find that a lot of your lesson planning involves going out and finding out what other people have done on the internet and shared with other teachers. Um, now that's a big change from say when I went through pre-service teacher education where the only resources I could go and find were maybe a book or two in the library. Nowadays if you've got to teach a lesson on something you just do some searches and find out thousands of different um, lesson plans and ideas that other teachers have already done and incorporate the best of those into your lesson. So the lesson planning process today is very very different to what it was in the past when teachers really had to make up all their own resources and their own ideas. So you've got lots of advantages in terms of just use of technology in that way. Um, but that's going to improve. As more and more learning objects and learning activities are put online, you'll be able to go and just select a, a module, say for learning about a concept in physics or in biology or whatever else you're learning. Um, say if you're learning the, the weather cycle, um, find one of the hundreds if not thousands of weather cycle apps that now exist and incorporate that into your lesson. Um, and the big advantage of that in the future is that you might be able to use a whole range of those and differentiate your teaching so that for those students that need to look at the concept at a particular level, you provide resources for them to look at it at that level. And for those students that are um, needing a greater challenge and a greater in-depth examination of the concepts, you find resources that will assist in teaching them about those and at, at, about the concept at that level. And if you've got some students that need really remedial stuff, then there'll be resources that you can do for that. In the past, as a teacher, providing all the resources in a lesson for all of the different levels of student ability was very difficult. Um, and that's known as differentiation of the curriculum or soft student learning. Um, but technology is making that more and more viable. So Emma mentions that she's been attempting to add her comments and questions for quite a while now, and she's finally figured it out. Congratulations, Emma. OK. Now, let's move on then from learning objects and the drill and practice aspects of math mathletics and so forth. I'll briefly mention intelligent tutoring. Has anyone had any experience at all with any intelligent tutor tutoring systems whereby the computer adjusts um, what it presents you based upon your previous practice or the problems that you've solved or questions you've answered? Okay. Well, over time, you'll see more and more of these being introduced into school. Um, Charlotte may be answering something in a foreign language that I don't understand, but if so, that may be a very insightful comment, but unfortunately, I only really read English. Um, is, intelligent, is intelligent tutoring um, basically like number works? Um, I'm not too sure about number works, but it certainly may be. Uh, basically, it's, it's software that adapts itself and then we'll ask different questions based upon students' previous responses or present different information to students or b different learning activities based upon what it's seen as the level of students' understanding of those concepts. Okay, so Charlotte may be from Mexico and joining us and responding to some questions. Hi, Charlotte. Okay, so it looks like no one's really had any experience with intelligent tutoring systems. I might see if I can find some online ones and provide you with links to those, just so you've got a little bit of experience with them, because you will find them used more and more in schools as they develop. Um, probably the most effective one at the moment would be the Khan Academy. Um, 
the Khan Academy, which is known for its video clips. And as maths and science teachers, you really should have a look at Khan Academy because it's got a fantastic collection of video clips that students can use. And you can incorporate into your own lessons. Say, if you've tried to explain a concept to a student and they haven't quite got it, um, directing them towards the a video clip developed on the Khan Academy to help explain the same concept, but in a different way, may be a very effective approach that you could incorporate into your teaching. And likewise, if you've got students that are wanting to move ahead, but you're not really confident enough or prepared to uh, provide them with instruction on some new concepts, you could direct them towards the Khan Academy concepts and they could do some independent learning about those concepts. But in relation to the intelligent tutoring, um, there is underlying the Khan Academy now a whole piece of intelligent software that analyzes students' learning of the various concepts as they go through the various video clips and will adjust the suggestions as to what they learn next based upon um, their progress through their various learning. And they're spending lots of money to develop up that and improve that system to make it a more effective instructional um, tool. Okay, so any final questions on the different apps and approaches to tutoring systems that we may have in our schools? Would the tutoring systems actually cost a lot of money to put into the schools? Some do. Um, the Card Academy, though, because it's being funded by some philanthropic organizations, such as the Microsoft um, Foundation and so forth, they, sorry, the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, um, they often have external funding to help develop their tools. And so they're provided for free. Um, but there are a lot of commercial ones. Mathletics, for example, is a commercial organization. They don't have a huge cost, but it is like about $30 per student to use that software. Um, and more and more, as we see large companies invest into developing these systems, you will probably find increasing cost. Um, a lot of our textbook publishers at the moment are also exploring the use of these systems so that they can bundle the software with the textbooks and provide a greater opportunity for, for schools to invest in their textbooks. Um, so you may see more and more related to that and the costs involved, but schools being schools, they don't have a huge amount of money to spend on such systems as that, so they really need to be shown to be very, very effective before they'll invest, particularly on a whole school basis. Um, in that. That's why many of the systems will often direct themselves towards parents in terms of out of school tutoring. Um, particularly, lots and lots of maths ones available now whereby you can purchase or subscribe to that will assist with students learning of maths problems. Um, and they often incorporate, or at least say they incorporate, um, an intelligent tutoring system that adjusts depending upon the students' um, learning in mathematics. Okay, any other questions about any of those? Um, isn't tutoring functions undermining the teaching, eventually putting us out of work? Yes, Maria, that's an interesting question about whether or not intelligent tutoring systems and so forth um, can replace some of the aspects of teaching. And there's a famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke, a science fiction author, that was that if any system, any computerized system that can replace a teacher, probably should, uh, in that if you're teaching at a level whereby a computer can do just as good a job, then really you probably need to question the value that you provide to the classroom environment. That said, there are lots of advantages, though, of teachers over what computers can currently do, particularly around inspiring students and engaging students with the learning process, but also in dynamically adjusting to what the students do. And you need to remember a lot of learning occurs through simple observation, whereby students observe you and your attitudes and your engagement and enthusiasm for learning, and their learning is a reflection of your um, attitude to that. That's why teachers' attitude to different subjects is so very important. If you present a, a negative attitude to technology or to, or to mathematics or to science and say, oh, and give a little quick comment such as, I'm not very good at science or mathematics, that can have a tremendous impact upon students' engagement with those subject areas. Of course, a lot of learning is done um, through their through your modeling of the learning process. So it's something to be very careful of in that respect. But it is an important aspect. Um, there are th areas of traditional teaching that will, re will be replaced by technology and have been over time. Um, the textbook replaced a lot of what teachers used to do. Um, 
and video clips and now computerized digital technologies are replacing a lot of aspects of teaching. But that doesn't mean that teaching can't evolve and change to adapt to that and incorporate those technologies to allow us to focus on doing other things more effectively. For example, differentiating the curriculum and engaging students in the learning process more effectively. A um, few other questions. I've watched a Khan Academy clip, but it's not as interactive tutoring approach. No, Maria, you do actually have to sign up for the um, interactive tutoring aspect of it, um, and it will then guide you through which clips to actually watch. So just watching one of the clips doesn't necessarily engage the interactive aspect, but if you go further into the website and into the actual interactive um, aspects of it and intelligent tutoring aspects, then it can help guide you as to which clips you then subsequently watch. Um, are there any schools who are known for being first to experiment with new technologies? Oh yes, there are various schools that um, engage with different technologies at different times. There's a couple of schools on the Gold Coast that are engaging with online computer game or computer games at the moment. There's a primary school just up the road along the freeway that's doing everything um, incorporating computer games. Um, John Paul College used to uh, promote itself as being one of the very first laptop schools um, and that was the technology that they were first to champion and engage with. And various other schools are incorporating different technologies. St Hilda's here at Southport, um, they're doing a lot of work with um, iBooks and interactive um, textbooks and that's sort of one of the technologies that they're being the first to engage with. So lots of schools are sort of first in various areas and lots of schools have been first in various areas over time. But as time goes on, maybe they're no longer as technologically advanced or innovative as they may once have been. So it really depends upon the school, but every school tries to be advanced in at least one or two areas. And from Emma, do interactive whiteboards connect to the internet or to download apps that can be used on them, or do they come with them already programmed? Now, Emma, generally they are connected to your laptop or sometimes to your tablet device, and the apps are run off those devices not necessarily off the actual interactive whiteboard itself. Um, there were a few experiments to get interactive whiteboards to have a computer built into them and do that, but it was generally found that it was easier to have an external computer computing device connected to the interactive whiteboard and have things run on that. Okay, so a few other technologies that have been used, the polling system, has anyone ever used a polling system whereby you had a device which you clicked on and gave your answers or true or false or things of that nature during a lecture or a lesson? Okay, well that's another technology that's sort of come and gone. Um, it's, it was very popular for a few years but then has, has dropped away as most people now have laptops or tablets or mobile devices that can do the same thing. But you may find in, a, in one of your lectures you come across a system whereby all the students will be asked to respond to a question by uh, putting it in an SMS code or um, answering via, via a website and then a graph will be produced of the students responses and things like that. Um, I might try to put one of those into one of these sessions. Generally because of the interactive nature of our Q&A in here we don't necessarily need to use those polling devices but just to show you what they're like I'll, I'll put a poll into our next um, whole group discussion. Okay, okay. So, so that's the mobile that's response the systems. System. Let's then move on to publishing. Well first off, have there been any questions about anything that you wanted to ask that we've covered so far? Um, with the interactive uh, polling systems, mm -hmm. I know um, the biosystems lecturer, Fred Lusch, he uses a polling system online called Socrates to ask questions and you use it through the internet on like a web-enabled device. Yes. So yes. he tends to do that every couple of lectures. Yep. And that's what I'll be showing you um, next time, a, a web-based one. Of course, we won't send you all out an individual device that you need to press buttons on because um, that would be expensive. Uh, but you could think of it, you've probably all seen the worm during some of the election coverages, maybe you haven't watched any election coverage, um, but basically the worm was everyone in an audience had a, a polling device and when they liked what the politicians were saying during a debate they would press a particular button and when they disliked what the politicians were saying during a debate they would press another button and it would then record how many 
of how many in the audience were seeing what the politician was saying as a positive versus how many that in the audience were seeing it as a negative and providing that as an interactive graph during a lesson. Um, but they have been used in maths classes and particularly around statistics and so forth where you get all the students to respond based upon various questions you want to get and collect data in that way. And there are some interactive polling devices that can also incorporate into science probes um, whereby you can collect data interactively and then use that as part of uh, your data collection for science experiments. Okay, um, in a software course Ned did, um, he used it in every lecture and it seemed effective in seeing what the class, yeah, what the level of class was at. Yes, often they're used by the lecturer just to see whether or not students are understanding questions that are being asked or concepts that are being presented and they can be an effective way of getting feedback immediately um, particularly when you, you've got a fairly fast flowing lecture and you don't want to interrupt it with asking lots of questions um, in that way. Okay, let's move on then to publishing and the first thing is around web publishing. So, who here has produced, created their own website? Yeah. Yep, so a few of you have. Has anyone never created a website or published anything online in that respect? Okay, so a couple of you. So that's probably some things you're going to need to learn about as we come to our first assessment task uh, where you're doing up a little digital portfolio. And here you're going to be using um, Google Sites, which is a nice, simple, free um, web publishing tool. And you're going to be creating a basic website. Um, that will also represent a digital portfolio, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, generally, the technology now makes it very simple to do. But when it's your first time doing something, it's always a little bit different and scary. And so we need to go through that and make sure everyone is able to create a basic website. And I've provided you with lots of options or lots of different little subtasks to do to add more and more functionality to that website, such as adding a calendar or a Google Doc or a presentation um, and incorporating that into your website. Um, now Tiana asks a question. I think it's good because not everyone wants to stick their hand up and let everyone else know that what they think the answer is. Yes, um, in terms of polling systems, particularly the anonymous polling systems, they are effective in allowing students to ask questions, particularly the shyer students in your class. Um, and allowing them to participate without um, the risk of being seen as a failure or asking a silly question or responding inappropriately. So Emma hasn't um, published nor created a website, but she will be soon because um, that's your task to complete over the next week or next week and into next week um, is to create your digital portfolio. So I'm going to be producing a little um, a little video clip showing you the process for that, um, but there's lots and lots of resources online on how to do digital portfolios or creating a, a simple website using Google Sites, um, and hopefully most of you will be able to incorporate to use those technologies rather than relying upon the basic little video that I present to you. Um, but yeah, it's something that we do need to be very familiar with nowadays. Of course, most of you will be expected to put online resources up for your students to use through your school websites or your other online sources that you create for your students. And of course you'll need to be teaching your students how to do so. Of course more and more there's an expectation that students will be publishing in that way. Um, okay, so Tiana's also mentioning that she has not done a website yet. That you will very soon. Um, so I encourage you all over this, the end of this week and into next week, certainly next week, is to get started on creating a website for your digital portfolio. Um, have a look at the resources that I've provided you already and I'll see how they go and then provide you for additional stuff as it seems necessary. But the idea really is for you to teach yourself how to do it or to use the resources and the help desks and the help videos and all the rest to explore how to actually create it. Okay? None of the tasks are particularly difficult. Um, they're all very simple tasks. I've chosen them specifically for that, but they progressively incorporate more complex ideas. If you get stuck, see how you can um, use the online resources, the help desks and the uh, videos, clips and so forth to overcome them. But if you get really, really, truly stuck, you can ask questions onto the online discussion forum and I'll provide you with advice on how to progress your website. But get started. Um, 
It really is as simple as creating a Word document or a Word process document. You just have to get your head around viewing things from a slightly different uh, perspective and what can be done in creating an online website. Anyone have any questions about that? Because I'm hoping that it'll be in your front of your mind as you're producing it. Has anyone completed their digital portfolio website yet? Has anyone started? <laughs> OK, so probably something to get started this week. Um, there will be a few bits and pieces along the way with the more advanced aspects of the task that, you, that will trip you up. Um, and you'll have to do some research and to find out how to do them. They've been designed to progressively introduce more and more difficult concepts as you go through creating the um, portfolio. But get started. Um, if anyone's got any real difficulties just getting started, that's probably where I want to provide most of my assistance, um, just to make sure you can get things going. And remember, if you're asking questions or seeking advice, include a link to the actual website. Uh, make sure you've made it public, so you've published and made it public, uh, and then include that link so that I can then have a look at what you've done and provide advice based upon that. OK. So on to websites. Um, it is expected that you will, as a teacher, do more and more of your publishing of material onto your school website or your personal websites, etc. And providing handouts and so forth is really old hat, um, where if all of your students have got digital devices and the internet at home and laptops and so forth, printing out paper and giving that to them is far less efficient than simply putting it up on a website and then providing them with the link to that. Um, Paper-based handouts are notorious for going missing and not making it home or getting lost or damaged and destroyed. But a website, it's very easy to say, OK, it's always there. Um, you can get access to it. Even if it is just a paper-based document that you um, upload and have them then download and look at as though they were looking at a print, printed document. OK, Tiana, in terms of submitting it, I'll be putting up the, the links to do the submissions this week. Um, if you're ready to submit, uh, well, I'll be having them up, putting them up today and tomorrow. Um, so there'll be an assignment um, submission option under assessment on your Learning at Griffith website. You simply click onto that, and then you either, in the text box that's there, you can put a link to the actual website. Or if it's one of the tasks where you need to attach something, you can also attach them as documents and so forth. Uh, now, Tiana's thinking it's more costly to use paper and printing. Absolutely, and you'd be very surprised how um, problematic it is in schools. And often teachers are given a paper allocation, say 100 pages per year, in order for printing. And if you print out too much, you find you've run out of that paper allocation. And then you either you buy your own ream of paper and bring it in and use that, um, or go and begging your principal for more paper to print on and so forth. Um, it's becoming less of a problem now as we have more focus on digital um, publishing. But in the past, it has been a big problem in schools, whereby schools have only got a certain budget for printing. And once that budget starts getting um, close, then you find in term four, very little printing occurs. Of course, the budget's been exceeded. Um, but certainly, digital printing is a way of um, overcoming that. Emma also asks, in this course, as well as our digital portfolio and log of learning, do we also have an exam on the course content and what we discuss here? OK, not an exam as such, but there will be the uh, four quizzes that you need to do, um, which are based upon the content of the readings and so forth. But from the various readings, you get to choose uh, four of those and then um, do the quiz on those. So they're like little exams. but no, you don't have a formal exam where you all come in and sit behind desks and have an invigilator watching you as you complete a um, paper-based exam. So Tiana, the rest you have to pay for? In some schools, yes. Although, more often than not, um, basically it just doesn't get done when the budget is exceeded in that respect. But you will find a lot of teachers do spend a lot of money um, purchasing their own resources, their own paper, their own um, pencils and pens and art supplies, et cetera, particularly in the primary years when those resources are used up a lot and unfortunately the budgets are rather stretched. 
Um, are we expected to report on which questions we've asked during the Hangout? Yes, you are. In, if you want to do your Hangout um, as one of your completion tasks, um, you will be asked to take note of which questions you've asked and responded to, um, and include that as a little document that you um, include when you submit that task. Um, but remember, these are recorded, so you can always go back and reflect upon that later. And you can also incorporate questions you've asked and responded to on our discussion forums. Um, and Stephen asks, can you please upload the content for next week this Friday? Uh, yes, I will certainly try to, Stephen. I do realize I was a little bit late in getting the content up um, this week. I think I got it up on Saturday night or Sunday morning. Um, and I will endeavor to get as much of it up as possible because there's two modules I know and I've pretty much got the gaming one finished, but the other one, the virtual reality and augmented reality, I think it's on, um, I'm still working through and producing. Unfortunately, the difficulty of producing textbooks for you guys does mean that it's a fair bit of work to get completed, and sometimes it's a little bit late in getting it polished. But I endeavor each week to get the content up on Fridays, but sometimes it does take me a day or two um, to get that published. Okay. Other aspects about websites. Um, we talked a little bit about e-portfolios. Now, in some schools, or has anyone ha ever produced an e-portfolio or been in a school where all the students are producing an e-portfolio or digital portfolio or other aspect? Now, Emma, in terms of um, doing the quizzes, you shouldn't do the quizzes until actually we've had the discussions about the content for that week because the quizzes are based upon the content. So while I have designed the assessment to be able to be done progressively during the course, um, week one, no. Um, week two, the initial quizzes basically for the introductory quiz, the practice quiz, and some of the introductory activities will be being made available. But no, normally we expect you to work on things as they occur and you've learnt about the content, um, and then the assessment is available. We don't generally try to assess you before you've actually learnt the material that the assessment is based on. Um, so, while I do talk a bit about assessment as we go through the course initially, and we do have those things made available, um, there is not the, yeah, you can't do the assessment before you've done the learning. So, have a little bit of patience in terms of engaging with the assessment. That's why I don't make it all available initially, because then we have too many students trying to do the assessment tasks before they've actually done their learning. Um, so, you know, you're not behind in the assessment. The main thing you should be focusing on in this course is that digital portfolio, because um, that is due at the end of week th or beginning of week four, end of week three, and you do need to make sure that's done. So that should be your focus, and then start having a look at some of the practice quizzes and the quizzes that are available, um, and have a look at some of the completion tasks over the next few weeks, and start getting a few of those done and seeing what that's like, and then around about week. Six or so, you should be starting to think about the second major assessment, your portfolio of learning, um, and some of the activities that can contribute to that. Uh, Kendra asks, would using ICT created things like Prezi's and websites end up more time consuming for teachers? I know that they're already stretched for time, and making all these makes things harder. Yes, they can, um, and creating resources to use in a classroom can be time intensive, although most teachers now are becoming familiar with creating PowerPoint presentations and things of that nature and prezies, and they're finding that since they've got to go through the lesson preparation anyhow, um, the structure of creating the presentation that they then present in a classroom does help them in that process. But some teachers do go overboard and create very detailed resources to use in the classrooms. Um, I certainly was guilty of that when I was a pre-service teacher and beginning teacher and you will find that it can use up a lot of your time. But that said, more and more of these resources are now available on the internet that others have created, and repurposing and modifying what other people have already created can save a lot of time. And that's an advantage you have that previous generations of teachers didn't have. Okay, so it doesn't look like anyone's had any experience with digital portfolios or e-portfolios. There are some university courses, um, not ours, but where you do everything as digital portfolios um, in some of our Bachelor of Education courses where they're doing the full four-year degree programs. They're creating an e-portfolio of everything they do during their degree, um, and they can be very useful. 
and you might find it useful to do a digital portfolio up as you go through your degree, particularly for when you go for employment. Um, often employers will ask to see a portfolio of what you've learnt and are able to do, and it's a great resource to be able to show them various things that you've done on your practicums and the various assignments that you've done and so forth. So I encourage you to populate your digital portfolio as you go throughout your degree program. Um, I don't think it's a compulsory aspect of your course, although I do know a number of other subject areas will be incorporating, maintaining and expanding upon a digital portfolio. And the digital portfolio that you're creating as a template will serve you in that when you come across that in your other subject areas. Okay, any questions about digital portfolios from the readings? I'm doing an awful lot of talking this session. Um, the idea is for you guys to ask questions and discuss things and provide prompts. Thanks, Kendra. What about copyright for using teacher resources online? Very good question. Um, in general, if you're just making them available to your students and not making them available to the public, there's not an issue uh, because you're covered by various copyright um, rules available for teachers. Um, and again, we'll talk briefly about those later on in the course. However, if you're putting them online and they've been um, produced commercially by other organizations and, or say from a textbook, etc., then there can be big problems. Um, so that's why a lot of schools maintain a learning management system, which is a closed environment whereby students have to enroll before they can get access to the resources, and then generally it's okay. They are looking at changing the Australian laws to include what's known as fair dealing, um, a law that does exist in America, but not here, whereby if you're doing it for an educational purpose, and as long as you're not trying to exploit it and make money out of it, um, then it's seen as an, a, um, an acceptable thing to do. But we don't quite have that law established in Australia yet, although there is moves to try to incorporate that. So you do have to be careful. Generally, though, um, one way around it is if you're getting stuff off the internet, simply ref provide links to the existing material, um, and then it's okay to use. Um, other ways, again, we'll talk about these in later sessions, are around concepts such as Creative Commons, whereby um, teachers can make their work available um, under a Creative Commons license and indicate then that it's available for anyone to use um, without retaining copyright. And also you can put other restrictions on that, so you can make it available for anyone to use for educational purposes or anyone to use for non-commercial purposes, etc. So that's what I put all of my stuff up online as, um, so it's available for use for non-commercial purposes. Um, and then any teacher can use this material uh, without having to seek permission directly from me to be able to use it. That said, however, um, I do have to spend a lot of time when I prepare resources for you guys going through and ensuring that I, I only use material that's not um, subject to copyright. And it is a big imposition when you prepare material. If, however, I was only providing this through the learning management system, through the um, Learning Griffith, then I wouldn't have to be as um, stringent in preparing that. Of course, if it's only available for your students to use, you can um, use things much more freely. Um, what if you put up links to the original? Yes, so Tiana, that's a good way of getting around copyright. Um, there is some dis discussion as to whether or not that does infringe copyright, um, providing links to commercial products whereby they're um, producing it for commercial reasons, but generally it's seen as an acceptable educational use. Um, so that's one way of getting around copyright issues. Okay, the other aspect that I mentioned in the um, resources is maintaining your personal learning environment. Um, this is where you use a whole lot of resources, such as websites and blogs and um, things like Facebook or Twitter, to maintain a collection of resources and links to other people um, to support your ongoing learning. And more and more that's been seen as how teachers can maintain their ongoing professional learning. And as students, you can expand your learning network to incorporate more effective learning rather than just relying upon the learning material provided by your lecturers. And in schools, more and more students are having a much wider learning network than just what their teachers provide. And that can be challenging for teachers. Um, when you're teaching a particular concept on physics and the students say, well, actually, Khan Academy explained that much more effectively than you have. Um, I learned it much more easily through Khan Academy. And that can challenge the authority of many teachers. 
And so if you see yourself as the only source of information for your students, that can become very challenging. And unfortunately, a lot of teachers do feel that way. Um, and they can be very challenged by other opinions and other ideas. Um, they used to be very challenged by students having their own tutors outside of school time. Um, but as more and more resources are available for students to use and get access to expertise other than their teacher, um, the authority of teachers simply to say, accept my word for it, is being challenged. I know even of students that have their, their tutor online when they're in class. And if the teacher is saying something and they don't quite understand it, they'll simply talk to their tutor um, via their internet connected device and get a different perspective from their tutor. And that challenges teachers as well. So there's a whole range of different, um, different uses of technology now in classes. Even so far for students recording what occurs in the classroom and having their tutors then uh, explain how the teacher explained things and critique the teacher. That can be very challenging for teachers. And there's various um, discussions going on about whether or not it's okay for teachers or for students to actually record what teachers say during their lessons. Um, so lots of new technologies exploring different challenges to how we go about the business of teaching. Any questions or comments about any of those things? Um, I used to tutor uh, quite a few kids, um, maths and chemistry, um, and maths C as well. And I quite enjoy just like being able to talk to the kids about how they learn. And more so, I didn't really use technology. I used the textbook. It just went old school basic. basic. And um, I think <laughs> I enjoy that's the way I learned. So I quite enjoyed just doing that. Um, however, if, well, back when I was doing it about a couple of years ago, I think with technology and being able to have like a screen with a laptop and things like that and being able to say, you know, this is how you do it kind of thing and, and doing it that way, I think that would have made my life even more easier when I was tutoring children. Absolutely. Mm. And it's even getting to the challenge stage whereby there may be video cameras in your classroom broadcasting what you're teaching so that um, initially they're being used in a couple of schools here in southeast Queensland so that you can reflect upon your own practice afterwards but also they're being used for peer reflection whereby a group of teachers will sit around and look at the various recordings from their classrooms and discuss how they could each improve their lessons but there's then pressure from parents to also have access to that so that they can actually see what's happening and then assist their students when they're doing their homework or out of school study um, and reflecting upon the teaching that's occurring in the classroom. And even for students, say, at home, uh, if they're sick or homebound or travelling, being able to still maintain contact with what's occurring in the classroom through video transmission. Um, but of course, that raises a lot of issues for teachers. Teachers have been very used to having a closed door classroom environment where what they did was very private with their students. But as the advantages of such technologies and of the learning that opportunities that emerge from that, there is more and more pressure on teachers and schools to open up the classroom spaces to um, scrutiny from others. Now, there was once upon a time where we used to have inspectors, that, and there are still many countries around the world where they do have inspectors, which would come around and sit in the back of your classroom and observe you. And indeed, for many pre-service teachers, you'll have a, another teacher or or well, certainly on your pre-service experiences, you'll have a, your practicum supervising teacher sitting in the back of the classroom watching you and providing advice later on how you could have improved things. But some principals do the same and some heads of departments will also sit in on classes just to be able to see how you're going and provide constructive criticism and critique to improve your teaching. Um, sometimes it is used in an inappropriate way to uh, punish teachers, but ideally and certainly the intent of such systems is to provide ways of improving our teaching practice. A couple of comments, um, one from Charlotte. Pretty much what I look for is a lifestyle studying, lifestyle studying architecture, but it is difficult, very difficult if you do not study. Um, okay, well thanks Charlotte. Um, I think technology is helping you with your own study processes in that respect. Okay, any other questions about the idea of opening up the classroom for scrutiny by others through the use of technology? Has anyone ever experienced any team teaching where you had two teachers that would teach you? Okay, that's another approach used. Um, it was very popular for a while. Um, 
And in fact, we redesigned our schools here in Queensland to enable team teaching, where you had the schools with the um, concertina dividing walls that could be opened up to allow um, one classroom to be taught by multiple teachers and so forth. Um, but teachers being teachers, it didn't prove particularly popular, um, and we've moved away from that again. Although team teaching still does occur in some of our primary schools. It has, though, been used for a bit of success in some of our high schools, say in a science um, context, particularly when you've got various um, teachers with specialisations in the sciences. Um, and say if you're teaching in middle school year 10 science, um, you might have the classes rotate through the various specialist teachers. So you've got the physics teacher teaching the aspects on physics, the biology teacher teaching the aspects on biology and so forth. So there are various ways of incorporating team teaching at various levels, particularly when you've got specialists. And got Tiana and Kendra both having some experience with team teaching. Okay, let's get on to blogs and wikis. Has anyone ever maintained their own blog? So a blog is an online diary, or basically an online log. I know that Wikipedia saved my life when I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we'll talk about Wikipedia in a second. Okay. Um, so we've had a few. So Kendra, what did you maintain a blog about? Was it a personal um, private blog or a personal blog about your own life or was it a particular context for an assignment or so forth? Oh, sorry, so that was from Maria. Um, Kendra didn't have a particularly happy experience with team teaching for Math C. Um, and certainly some context it may not be appropriate for. So Maria, what was your experience with blogging? Okay, we might have a bit of a delay and, and they might be referring to team teaching. Uh, and Tiana mentions also when a teacher is having some difficulties and having observations of their work done um, to provide them with some assistance. Um, yes, Tumblr is an example of a type of blogging um, and there are various other forms of blogging whereby we use photo blogs. Um, Picasso and um, oh, what's the big one that does all the images? Uh, well, there's various other types of blogging and yes, so fandom is a very popular form of blogging where you blog about a particular area of, or a passion that you've got. Um, might be a book or a movie or so forth. Um, some people just have it as a personal blog whereby they make it public um, and keep it as a diary, an online diary. But a lot of blogs are also used as reflective processes for learning, whereby if you're doing an assignment, and particularly if it's a group assignment, uh, maintaining a common blog about that where everyone keeps making contributions about how they're going but also just as a reflective process whereby you maintain a blog about your learning during an assignment and then can reflect upon that. But in some schools, students are encouraged to maintain a blog throughout their entire um, schooling year and it's a great way of then reflecting upon the process of the learning as you go through that year, particularly at the end, when you can look at, back at how you thought about things at the beginning and how your thoughts have changed during the year or during whatever the concepts are that you're learning. And so, yep, so Kendra's ma been maintaining one for two years now. They can be very effective. In fact, some people have even found them lucrative, whereby you can get a large audience uh, following what you blog about. And then through uh, um, on-screen advertising, they've been able to maintain a healthy income through popular blogs. But in schools, we tend to do them as part of the reflective process or diary processes. That leads us into wikis. Now, has anyone not used Wikipedia for an assignment. Okay, so Wikipedia has really replaced the um, encyclopedia. Okay, up until 10 years ago, before Wikipedia, everyone would go to the library to consult Encyclopedia Britannica or one of the World Book Encyclopedias, etc. And if you're lucky enough, you had your own encyclopedia at home, and each year you might get a couple of volumes being updated and so forth, and they were a really big investment. Often parents would save up a lot of money and sometimes buy them one, one volume at a time in order to make the payments to keep a, uh, a encyclopedia collection at home. Of course, this was before the internet. And if you had a question, you couldn't Google it. Um, you had to go and either try to find it in an encyclopedia or go to a library and try to find it in one of the books that might be in a library co collection. So Wikipedia and Google itself, in terms of search engines, have really changed the way we engage with knowledge and really changed a large aspect of schooling. Um, 
a big thing of early schooling used to be around doing assignments where you'd have to go and research from an encyclopedia and basically make a summary of that and present that as an assignment. Nowadays that's become so trivial with being able to go to Wikipedia or other websites and other encyclopedia type websites and copy and paste that, that the old um, investigative assignment has changed dramatically and our expectations of what students can do um, has also changed. So a few comments. Wiki Wikipedia was never accepted at school for me, but it's always a good starting point. Yes, a lot of teachers were very hesitant to use Wikipedia as an authoritative resource. Uh, of course, initially it was definitely, and still to a large extent, is maintained by crowdsourcing, whereby anyone can contribute and make changes to and improvements to uh, the Wikipedia. Now, encyclopedias were always done the same way, but they had a sm very small selection of experts that would make those changes. And those changes would then take many years to change. Um, but there's been a number of studies done in terms of the accuracy of Wikipedia, and it's been shown that Wikipedia is at least as accurate as print-based encyclopedias, those that still exist. Um, the expert-based model, whereby you have a small number of experts trying to maintain summaries of large disparate bodies of knowledge, has been shown to be very difficult to maintain, and that processes like Wikipedia are as effective, if not more effective in many cases, certainly in being up-to-date and responsive to changes. So in general nowadays, I would actually um, see a student's assignment whereby they hadn't used Wikipedia as being problematic because they're not accessing the latest resources and the latest information about concepts, particularly in my area where it's very dynamic in terms of new technologies and so forth. Now, if you're in more um, sustained areas where changes don't happen very often in terms of the material being accessed, then there may be more argument to say that we should be going to primary resources and other so forth things, particularly in study of history, etc. Um, but as a secondary resource, of course, Wikipedia never has any new material. It always has to refer to existing material um, in terms of its referencing and access to resources. If you put up any stuff that doesn't already exist out there, it will be rejected. Um, so the idea of Wikipedia is that it's a collection of summaries of existing material that already exists. Um, so Kendra doesn't like Wikipedia. It doesn't make any sense. Databases and books do so much better. Well, that's an approach you might consider um, exploring, Kendra. Although I would suggest nowadays that there are a lot of advantages of Wikipedia, and you should probably be at least being familiar with it, because certainly most of your students will be using it. Yes, there are books available that often you can get more detailed information from. And as I mentioned, Wikipedia is simply um, a summary of existing material, often of books but sometimes there are websites and news clippings and other resources that exist. So as with an encyclopedia, it's not going to be as comprehensive in, and in detailed as you can get from specialist textbooks and other books written about concepts. But as a starting point for research and as a summary of the latest of things happening in a, in a field, it's certainly being shown as very effective. Um, now, Maria also mentions that wikis are very good for language teaching and collaborative writing. Okay, that's the use of wikis and creating your own wikis. Wikipedia is simply just one wiki. Um, a wiki is simply any online collection of documents. And in fact, you can see the internet itself as a very large wiki, but wikis generally are defined as small um, collections of um, content about a topic or concepts. And you'll find wikis around science concepts, around maths concepts. A lot of textbooks now are being written as wikis. Um, so a science textbook is a great example. It, they're very often written now as wikis now, particularly if they're an online textbook. And you can simply link between concepts. So if you're looking at mitosis and you want to look at um, another concept related to that, there'll be a hyperlink in there and it'll take you then to the page of information about that other concept that's related to that one. And you can jump between concepts very quickly and easily, which is really just what a Wikipedia is or wiki is. Um, and Emma has her bio and chem teachers did not approve of wikis. Well, again, that's an approach. Um, but as you find more and more, particularly science textbooks, are being written using that technology, I think that will be something that they'll have challenges with. Um, certainly, a lot of experts in fields that write textbooks, such as your professors and your academics, still encourage you to use um, textbooks and go into great depth in that respect. But uh, yeah, I think their, their position is going to be harder and harder to maintain over time as Wikipedia continues to improve itself and the process of editor editorial um, enforcement of the concepts and checks and balances um, continues to improve. 
Is Wikipedia um, accepted in university? Well, obviously Griffith University. Yes and no. Uh, depends Any upon other. individual, depend yeah. on individual academics. Certainly, in my courses, I actually um, penalise students that haven't used Wikipedia. Um, so I take sort of a bit of a reverse position. If, if cool. student, <laughs> so if if say in your research and you've provided a whole lot of references to material that you've looked at um, and are purporting it to be the latest in those um, resources, um, if you hadn't gone to Wikipedia and had a look at what is presented there in terms of the latest, which tends to be the latest, um, then that would show that you haven't tried to keep up with the latest writings about a particular concept. Um, that said, if you were going and exploring a particular item in detail beyond what was covered in Wikipedia, um, there might be an expectation that you would use other resources as well to support that. Um, that said though, particularly in most modern areas around technology and educational technologies, the Wikipedia entries tend to be, if not as comprehensive, sometimes more comprehensive than what other people have written about on other more authoritative sites or textbooks and so forth. Um, so, but again, as it depends upon the domain, if you're doing things in history, then Wikipedia may not be as appropriate. Um, but there are certain areas, particularly when you want the latest information and the most up-to-date information, where it is certainly appropriate. Um, I know my school was uh, pretty open about Wikipedia, and they suggested it as a starting point, but then this um, incident had happened where Matt C, a student, had essentially copied and pasted all his work off it and then gone in and changed the Wikipedia page to all this old incorrect working and then everyone else had copied and pasted that and gotten the incorrect working and that really changed their views on how it was because it was so competitive at trying to get first in the class, yeah. get the highest OP score. So There are to... issues around that um, but they have been addressed. Nowadays the majority of Wikipedia you can't go in and directly edit. Um, and anything that's at all controversial or anything that's being edited too quickly in that respect um, will be locked down and there'll be experts um, given authority over it, um, authorizing what changes can then be made. So you can suggest changes but then an expert will be there that will then um, approve or not approve those changes and more and more of Wikipedia is, is being applied to that model. Uh, large sections are not because there's not experts available for those areas and they're very dynamic and new and so forth and it's not so much of an issue. But certainly anything around a politically sensitive nature or anything that's up to a lot of debate, there is that problem. What you'll generally find though is that the, such changes as you describe will be very quickly picked up on and edited and returned back to normal. Um, there is a bit of graffiti as it's referred to on Wikipedia where people will go in and make um, changes and then they'll, they'll be very excited because no one's picked up on the change for many years. Um, there was an example uh, a local school whereby someone had gone in and changed the Wikipedia entry for the school and made uh, some humorous comments about one of the teachers on their official Wikipedia page and it wasn't picked up for a couple of weeks. Um, that just showed that no one was really looking at that website uh, or that Wikipedia entry but there are often little instances where that can occur. But in the main it's a very good self-correcting process whereby such changes are picked up often within minutes and then corrections made and that's why you find so many different warnings on Wikipedia pages saying this bit needs improvement or this bit needs changes and if you go to any of the Wikipedia entries you can go to the discussion page of that Wikipedia entry and you can see all the suggested changes made to be made and those that have been approved or not approved or discussions being happening about whether or not changes should be made of the Wikipedia entry. So it's a very dynamic ongoing editorial process occurring for all the Wikipedia pages um, and that gives it its strength whereby in a normal textbook or normal thing, when there's an error, really you've got to wait upon an, an errata being published and provided or the next edition coming out that corrects that error. And there have been quite a number of studies done to look at the number of errors that occur in normal textbooks versus what occurs on Wikipedia pages and they're very similar in terms of the, the number of errors that occur. Wikipedia has the advantage though of being able to correct those errors in a rapid way while um, other more traditional publishing forms don't have that advantage. So let's now look at some of those more traditional publishing forms as they transform themselves into um, more technological forms, in particular the ebooks and the digital textbooks. Of course, while many of your um, 
issues might exist with Wikipedia, you'll find that the traditional textbook and the traditional book is also undergoing dramatic changes and being turned into digital books. Now these are tending to follow the more traditional model of digital books, or of textbooks and books, but slowly they're becoming more dynamic whereby they can have updates done and automatically pushed out to you so that you don't have to buy the next edition, they'll be automatically updated if corrections need to be made. And sometimes there'll be sections such as multimedia and other things. So who's used a digital textbook? Yeah, we have one for biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and a... Um, it's continuously... Like 3D models or video clips, video clips, video clips and things like that incorporated uh, into the digital textbook? Yeah, there's throughout the entire textbook that take you to different, like, um, diagrams, videos, tutorials on how to do things, okay. even like surveys on like questions, quizzes. Yep. So there's a whole lot of advantageous, advantageous processes that have been, that have been incorporated, incorporated into our into textbooks, textbooks now that we can um, improve the effectiveness of that particular mode of instruction. Okay, so it looks like Stephen's having a few little difficulties. We're, we'll probably be wrapping up in a, about a minute or two, so hang in there, Stephen. Um, so any f other questions about ebooks or digital textbooks? Now probably one of the biggest changes happening is the actual encouragement of teachers to write their own textbooks and digital textbooks. Um, that's probably a big challenge for a lot of teachers. So it's in the past you've just used existing textbooks and sometimes um, you've created your own worksheets or summary sheets and so forth. But more and more schools are actually asking you to actually produce textbook quality material and publish that collectively. And that does change the, the, the dynamics of um, the teaching role uh, as you become more used to it. I'm finding that myself um, self-imposed, but I've taken on the challenge of providing you guys with textbooks, um, and that does involve quite a lot of work, particularly around copyright issues and other things that might be involved in producing material for that. But there are schools that are doing it very effectively. Um, again, St Hilda's here on the Gold Coast is producing digital textbooks for all their science and maths curriculum and that's going up on iTunes U. And I, suggest, I encourage you to have a look at iTunes U and look for St Hilda's and see all the different science textbooks and so forth they're making available because um, they're putting a fair bit of work into doing that. And you might find that they're available for you to use for your own teaching or for your pre-service teaching as you go through your courses. Okay, the last little thing mentioned in the course material was around graphics and video editing and 3D modeling. Any question anyone would like to ask about those? During this course you're going to get used to making little video clips um, and you might on our um, sessions on our um, on-campus workshop we'll also be showing you about the 3D printing and things of that nature. Um, I use iMovie all the time for like Wonderful. photos and everything and just chucking them all into one video and you don't have to worry about them ever again. <laughs> yep. And so now we'll be exploring how you might be able to incorporate that into your teaching, making yeah. little video clips and instructional clips and videos for your students to then look at um, and lots of different ways of going about using video and video editing in the classroom. Not just your students doing them, but also yourself doing them. Yeah, we'll just oh. With the course I did last year at uni, we had to make like an iron movie about like a, a child's development, so that's why I used my iron movie technique to check there. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Well, we're just about out of time, so if you have any other questions, you can ask those through our discussion forum. Um, and Kendra also mentions that at Trinity, um, kids are using their e-books on their iPads, and it's horrible. So Kendra, what's so horrible about it? So as we wait for Kendra to um, maybe make a response to that, there are challenges with the use of digital books. Um, they do change the way we engage with things, um, but there are also a lot of advantages. Um, students being able to carry around 100 odd books in their device does change the way we think about providing them with resources and uh, access to text. The idea that they might have an entire library on their personal device does change the way we think about libraries and the role of libraries and the collections that libraries maintain. Um, certainly here at the university we're doing a lot of work to maintain a repository of digital books um, in addition to the physical books that we've always maintained. So there are lots of different 
uh, processes we can go through and changes that are happening through our engagement with technologies. And digital textbooks and digital publishing is certainly one of those. But then we've also got 3D publishing coming up, uh, being able to print your own 3D models. So say if you're learning about um, the planets, printing out your own model of Jupiter and then having a look at diff different things about that is a different um, activity than other things we might have done. So it looks like Kendra's main concern is that it's difficult to turn the pages on digital textbooks. And yes, that might be a bit of a challenge, um, depending upon how the ebook has been configured. But in the main, digital textbooks do try to mimic the same um, processes we go through with reading a normal book. Um, but as Tanya points out, there are some advantages on ebooks, such as highlighting. Um, some ebooks now you can actually respond to quizzes during the actual reading of the ebooks. Um, and as I mentioned in the video clip, we can actually go through some way to actually analyzing how students go about the reading process and tracking when they've read certain things and even the way that they read through their use of ebooks. Um, Kendra is also a little bit concerned that you have to um, uh, have to. I'm not quite sure what she's saying. That both of them are constantly laughing at me because they can't find the content I want easily. Okay, so if you're trying to find content in a digital textbook, it can be difficult to find it quickly. But there are ways of getting around that through the indexing systems and also being able to search through the ebook. So it's different to how we find things in a normal book where we might flip the pages and quickly go to a section we think it's close to. Um, but you can do other technological approaches to finding content very quickly on an ebook by searching for keywords or using the contents page to jump to different sections of a textbook. The uh, whole aspect of catering for individual learning is enhanced by digital textbooks. Yes, having more resources means we can actually apply those resources to individual students and differentiate those to different students um, and assist with differentiation. OK. I'm and quickly, Tanya's you know the 3D there. model? Yes, you know so the 3D modeling, how is it yes. more, how can it be more related to older students? Like, I mean, 3D okay. modeling to me seems like something kids would really thrive on, not so much older students. Well, let's say you want to have students learn about the, uh, in biology, the different parts of the eye. Um, yes, in the past you might have made a model of the eye out of styrofoam and things like that, or you might look at a 3D image or a video image of a of an eye, or even get a real eye in and di dissect it. But actually having to create your own 3D model of an eye means you have to learn about different parts of the eye in order to build it into that model. So creating a 3D model on a computer and then printing it out gives you that tangible physical object you can then move around and have a look at, um, in addition to have, being able to move it around on a screen. So there are some um, tangible educational advantages of actually going through the construction process, uh, because it means you have to understand the parts of an object more in order to make it then into a physical model, particularly if that model has moving parts or things like that. So for example, if you're learning about making a catapult, making a working catapult um, tends to teach you more about catapults than if you're simply reading about it or watching videos or even interactives about use of a catapult. Um, so that's some of the advantages of doing modeling. Um, other things, say in, in physics, being able to make certain, or say in chemistry, making various um, molecules. Um, we have a lot of molecule kits in senior chemistry where the students pull them apart and reconfigure them based upon the different molecular configurations. Um, being able to make your own 3D models would be a similar process to that, whereby we can design it on the computer and then print it out as a 3D model and things of that, things of that nature. But I'm sure there'll be more and more different uh, approaches used in the various um, concepts as we go through. In mathematics, being able to create some 3D um, representations of complex mathematical um, models. So, for example, on, on a screen we might make a really interesting torus, um, but having two intersecting toruses and then intersecting with a, with a pyramid um, and then modeling that mathematically is something we can now do on our mathematical modeling programs. But then actually seeing that physically and being able to turn it around in our hands may give us a better understanding of how those all those intersections have occurred in the mathematical model that we've used to create a physical 3D object. So they're just a couple of ideas around 3D modeling. OK, any final questions, comments, or statements?
Okay then, well I look forward to discussing things with you next week. Bye bye for now.